thrilled to be talking about fast radio bursts with you this evening. Um, what you can see in the, uh, in the graphic uh, shown here is uh, the Parkes Radio Telescope. This is a 64 meter dish in New South Wales, Australia. And it was one of the uh, instruments that brought back the, the, the moon landing pictures. Um, uh, you can, there's a, a movie of uh, the dish uh, describing that. Anyway, it's an iconic radio telescope in Australia. Uh, this is a radio image uh, of the Milky Way. We saw some very nice optical images. This is what you see in the radio sky, and these are expanding shells of gas and electrons being accelerated by the magnetic field of the galaxy in some cases, or so a combination of those things. And this bright flash here is an artist's impression of what you would see if you, were, if you had radio uh, sensitive eyes to one of these radio bursts, these fast radio bursts as they're now called. So it's very bright. Uh, that's, that's basically the thing it's trying to get across there. It doesn't seem to be connected to the Milky Way at all. It turns out that they are a new phenomenon that is going across all over the sky, uh, a little bit like gamma ray bursts, but we know, we've know we known from, of those for, for many years, but in the radio sky. So once every 30 seconds or so, a, a flash of radio waves will go off, will last a few milliseconds, and then, uh, for the most part, never to be seen again. So it's a real mystery uh, as to uh, what they are. Just to orient ourselves a little bit, we have to uh, you know, familiarize ourselves with the, our visible light where, where we're most sensitive to. It's just part of a huge spectrum of radiation uh, going all the way from the shortest wavelengths in gamma rays up to the longest wavelengths in the radio. Uh, and so I am, by trade, a radio astronomer, so I use radio telescopes on the ground that are sensitive to long wavelength photons. Um, and these are low energy photons um, compared to the high energy gamma rays that, uh, that come from the most energetic events. Uh, but nevertheless, they are giving us clues about the high energy universe. We, we, you need to look across the whole spectrum of electromagnetic waves, uh, and now of course in gravitational waves, but that's, a, that's another story, to, to build up a really picture beyond what your eyes tell, tell you. So astronomers like me use many of these instruments uh, all you know, in space and on the Earth uh, to get this complementary view uh, of the universe. Um, so let me start with a nice optical image from National Geographic. This is in the southern hemisphere, the Milky Way. Um, these are the large and small Magellanic clouds, uh, one of our nearest uh, satellite <laughs> galaxies, which is, is also interacting with the Milky Way. Here's a comet going into the, uh, the horizon. Um, and, you know, beautiful night sky image. It's, it's, it's demonstrating a number of things. Most of the dots you see in this optical image are stars. Right? The, most of the, you know, these, these big blobs here are clearly galaxies, but most of the rest of the dots are actually stars, light from stars that come from the, Milky, the band of the Milky Way. Um, and then this comet here it will be gone in a few days or weeks. It's an example of a transient phenomenon. And so our, as we've learned about the universe over the years, we've, we've learned about this ephemeral side, which is basically the same from night to night. And then as we've gotten more and more sophisticated in our observations, we've been able to learn about transient phenomena, things that come and go. Uh, our ancestors saw the first supernovae uh, as guest stars in the, in the uh, daytime sky. Those are an example of transient objects. Uh, and this, these fast radio bursts are just another example of that. So here's what you would see if you had radio eyes from the Green Bank horizon. Specifically, if you had a radio eye that was 90 meters in diameter um, and, uh, and was sensitive to 5 centimeter radio waves. Instead of looking at stars, these, everything you see here is a galaxy, basically. So the stars are very weak in radio, so you see galaxies uh, as bright uh, point sources of radio. What I'm playing for you in the background is some radio noise um, that's coming from the Parkes radio telescope. Right on cue are some of these bursts, and they've been translated into an audio signal. So, the way it's been um, deep encoded for you is that you're hearing the highest frequency radio waves first. I'll wait for another one to come. So there's a thing on there. Just 
in the middle. Uh, and so you, and the, the lowest radio frequency arrives later, so there's this sort of chirp that you hear. <clears throat> and that's exactly what the radio telescope uh, detects as well. Um, so this is the phenomenon, and these are coming at random times, um, not exactly every 30 seconds. Some of them are, are very bright, some of them are really faint. Some of them come, you know, two of them came together at the same time from different places on the sky. This, this is a simulation um, that we've, we've put in there, but just to give you an idea of this component. So that, um, that radio eye that you just uh, saw there uh, that was producing that image was this telescope here. It's the precursor to the, to the Green Bank telescope. Uh, it's the 300 meter, sorry, the 300 foot telescope at Green Bank. Uh, and here it was in its last day of operation, November 15th, 1988. Unknown to the astronomer who took that picture, it was going to collapse uh, uh, overnight. And uh, here it is in the following day. It died of metal fatigue. Uh, it long outlasted its uh, design specifications. It was built in the early 60s and only had a lifetime of five to 10 years. So it, it did well, and it provided many interesting discoveries. Uh, and of course, out of the ashes uh, has arisen the Greenback Telescope which for new people or even people who have been seasoned members, if you've not been to the Green Bank Observatory, it's a fantastic day or weekend trip. Uh, if you can tie it in with one of these um, um, observing extravaganzas, that's great. But you can also just go any, basically any weekend of the year and tour the, uh, the observatory. Uh, and it's a, it's a really fun experience to take for, for people of all ages. In any case, this is the thing that drew me to West Virginia. Um, uh, 13 years ago, something like that. Um, I've been at West Virginia University in that time. Uh, and that's where the, um, uh, the story of fast radio bursts begins. But actually, you can trace it back even further back in time to over 50 years ago to the discovery of pulsars. So Jocelyn Bell, um, a student in Cambridge, UK at the time, found these radio blips that is seen here as these little pulses in, in this pen chart recording. And so these are um, uh, blips that are durations of a few milliseconds, uh, a few tens of milliseconds in duration. Uh, and they were coming from um, an, an unknown source of radio waves back in the day. We've since uh, learned, uh, and you know, you can have whole talks on, on this specific aspect of astronomy, but we've since learned that these pulsars are rapidly rotating, highly magnetized neutron stars. So just to step back, a neutron star is formed when a, a massive star explodes as a supernova. So the, the condensed uh, core of the star as it collapses gets uh, more and more dense, and the protons and electrons get squeezed together to form neutrons. And it becomes a stable star that's about the mass of the sun, but only the size of a, an inner city area, so 10, 10 kilometers or something like that. Basically, you can think of it as the next thing down from a black hole in terms of extreme density and gravity. So these things emit radio waves as they rotate. I will not put my laser pointer on here, but if you can imagine it shining a beam past you, you would get a pulse of light uh, as that uh, beam uh, passed your line of sight. And they have a north and south magnetic pole, just like a magnet. And so if you are looking along the line uh, to one of those poles, you will see these pulses. It's basically how they how they work. They're fascinating objects. Um, like I say, they've been studied extensively. I, I spent much of my career studying them and still do to some extent. Uh, in 1968, uh, 51 years ago, the Green Bank, uh, that 300 foot telescope, found these things here, these giant pulses. They were coming from a neutron star at the heart of the Crab Nebula. This is the remains of a supernova explosion from 1054 AD that was first seen by our ancestors. And what we see with the telescope these days are very occasionally, every few minutes, you'll get a really bright pulse of radio waves. It's, it's much, much brighter than the noise here. That's, you can think of that as the static that you're hearing in the background. And so these giant pulses have been known uh, for many years and, and studied. And, um, in the mid to late 70s, um, people, specifically one person, Stephen Hawking, came up with this idea that black holes could potentially emit such bright pulses as well as neutron stars. 
And these black holes could do it by, by his Hawking radiation process, where, they, where they're gradually losing energy, sorry, losing uh, radiation over time. They're not always just sucking things in, they're actually losing radiation as well, remarkably. And at the end of a, of a tiny black hole's life, they could explode uh, and produce a flash of, of uh, radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum. So people were looking for them um, years and years ago, these, these pulses. Um, and here, here's an example. Of this, this guy here is now a Caltech professor, and Joe Taylor won the Nobel Prize uh, for his, his work in pulsars. Um, this was a high school student working with uh, that professor at the time, so it was uh, an amazing uh, start. They didn't find anything, they didn't find the black holes back then, but they were the one of the first people to start looking for it. There were also some false alarms. People thought that they'd seen pulses uh, in radio data. Uh, and this is the, this is the chirping uh, that you could hear with your ears before. So this is high frequency here, this is 606 megahertz, 605 megahertz, so the pulse is going this way. Time is um, going this way, so it's a really confusing graph because everything's plotted the wrong way. So, it's like a waterfall. Yeah, it's what we call a waterfall plot. So you imagine the pulse goes like that, there's another one there. This is, uh, unfortunately, it, it was traced to uh, malfunctioning equipment. Uh, <laughs> nobody ever saw these pulses again, uh, and it was, it was pretty much discarded. Um, so this, this is, you know, traditionally, it's a very shaky area to get into. Uh, it seems very hard, you know, very hard to, to find these things and, and to convince yourselves that, that they're real. But over the years, people have been looking for them more and more deeply. I'm not going to get into this, this graph here, but it shows the pulsars uh, in terms of their various energetics. It's basically uh, luminosity, the, the brightness of the pulse versus pulse width. Um, but there's this, uh, there, it's this idea that there are, there are so much more, so many more things to discover than just the pulsars. There are flare stars out here, there's active galactic nuclei out here. Here are the giant pulses, but more energetic up here. And so people have long been wondering whether astronomical objects could exist in these, in these white areas over here where things hadn't been discovered. So as we've gotten better and better at uh, observing over time, we've started to fill in some of that empty space. <coughs> and here's an example. Back in 2004, uh, the lead author here, Maura McLaughlin, uh, she's also my wife, <laughs> and uh, so she and I uh, were in at Manchester at the time, before we moved to West Virginia. Um, and she found some of these pulses. Um, now these turn out to be um, pulses from neutron stars in the Milky Way. They're basically another manifestation of those pulsars that I was talking about. So they're really interesting, but they're, they're, it wasn't necessarily a new phenomenon. Um, this is the high frequency. So this is So that's the pulse that you can, you can eventually see if you do some data analysis. So that got us starting to, to think about uh, how to make progress. And when Maura and I came to West Virginia in uh, 2006, um, we got hold of some data from the Parkes Radio Telescope um, that was looking at the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. So here's a radio image of the Small Magellanic Cloud. Um, and you can see some of the, the arrows here are pointing to pulsars that have been found in those Magellanic clouds. So these are extra galactic pulsars. Um, but what we thought we would do is we would search the data for individual events. Um, so that was something new that we wanted to try. And so, to cut a long story short, what we are, what we are looking for is one of these sort of this is frequency versus time, so radio frequency versus time. We we're looking for an event. That that, uh, in the data. And so we have to construct uh, an analysis pipeline because we don't know this, this delay here. We don't know when the pulse starts and when the pulse ends. We don't know that total amount of delay. So we have to sort of try lots of different delays. Uh, and the, the parameter that we, it's a little bit of jargon here, we call this the dispersion measure. That's the, that quantifies the delay uh, in the data. We remove that dispersion measure from the data and we, we form a time series by adding everything up and we look for individual pulses in that time series. What you're looking at here is just noise, there's nothing significant there. 
Um, but if you do this for a whole bunch of different trials, then you can create a little summary plot like this. And just in a nutshell, what you're looking at here, these are individual pulses from uh, a known pulsar that we were looking at just to test our uh, observing system. And here is some stuff down here. This is interference from uh, local terrestrial sources. So it could be electric fences or uh, any, some type of airport radar, for instance, could do that. But you see that the pulsars are kind of standing away from that interference there. You can think of this axis here on the graph as being distance. So the further away from the Earth you are, the higher you are on this, this chart here. So we are looking for individual events. Uh, events. So that's what we did. Uh, and we had an undergraduate student look at these, uh, look at hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of these uh, pointings on the sky. Uh, and he found one. Here's some interference down here, uh, but here is the event that's, uh, that our student David found. Uh, it's got an extremely high dispersion measure. We use very funny units, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, centimeters to the minus three parsecs. <laughs> Many astronomers can come up with things like that. It makes sense to think about it, but not, I don't want to get into Anyway, you can think this, just think of this as distance. Uh, so this is the event that we, we found. So it, it basically, as you get as you get the right dispersion measure, it peaks, the symbol gets bigger and bigger, and then it fades away again. So that's that's the signal. It's quite, it kind of lives right there. So we got really excited about this, uh, and this was the first of these pulses that we found. So here's David, my student, and a younger version of me, um, and a copy of our paper that we uh, we published in Science back in 2007. Uh, describing this pulse. So this is what the pulse looks like when you when you make this waterfall plot. Um, so it's radio frequency versus time here. Uh, so it's a really bright event. Uh, we did lots and lots of tests. We made sure it wasn't malfunctioning equipment. Um, and we looked at that spot in the sky for 90 hours. Uh, we didn't see any follow-up pulses. And so we proposed rather boldly at the time that it was um, the, the prototype of a new phenomenon. Um, that, that came, it took a while, so that was uh, 13 years ago that we did that. It took a while for the field to, to really take off. And the, one of the reasons that, um, that it took a while was because people started finding other types of signals that looked a little bit like ours, but were clearly um, of terrestrial origin. So, I don't want to get bogged down in the details here, but this paper came out that was showing pulses that looked kind of similar to the ones that I, the one that I just showed you. But this little graphic here is um, telling you that the telescope is, is looking at different fields of view on the sky. Uh, and you could see the pulse in all of the fields of view, which, which meant that rather than coming from a distant astronomical object, where you would see it in only one beam, one, one field of view, it was coming into the telescope from an indirect path. It wasn't coming in through the regular optics. So it was something of terrestrial interference. But it happened to show very similar characteristics to this burst that had um, inherited my name at that point. And so the whole thing got really confusing for a few years. And these, these objects were called peritons, after this Greek uh, elk called a periton that casts a human shadow. So it's something that's masquerading as something else. Um, so this, this really um, took, a, took a while for astronomers to, uh, to understand what was going on, and even my own wife began to doubt the original uh, one that we found. Here she is um, with uh, some colleagues um, just finding some more of these paratons in, in another data set. We, we never lost faith in the original burst. It, did, it looked sufficiently different from these paratons. Uh, to, to give us hope, and so we, we just kind of pulled out. And so um, five years after the original one came out, another burst was found that was only was clearly only seen in one of the pixels of the receiver. It was coming from an astrophysical object. It had it had a dis different dispersion measure. And so things started to get really exciting again. And then we had uh, three more that came in 2013, <coughs> and these. Uh, these objects now began, rather than having one object, you have um, five of them. So there's a population of these sources, uh, cosmological distances, that's the title of this paper. And 
just to show you how different they are to pulsars, this is a graph of galactic latitude, which for those of you who are not familiar with that, it's the angle that you are away from the galactic plane. So if you're looking along the galactic plane, that's galactic latitude of zero. And if you're looking at the north or south galactic poles, that's plus or minus 90 degrees. So that's that angle there. And this is the dispersion measure, what you can observe for pulsars. It's that delay of the pulse that we're talking about. So this little background here, these are all of, all of the pulsars that we see in the, uh, in the Milky Way. And so this, this shape that you're looking at here is, is attributed to the stuff in the galaxy. Whereas these are the fast radio bursts, as we now call them. And you can see that they're quite distinct from that population. Here are some examples of these pulses. Um, they're just a few milliseconds in duration. So with a population, you had to have a, a name for them. So they could have been named after me. That would have been a, a little bit uh, too much, I think. Um, some people were calling them sparkers. Um, fast radio transients was... Uh, <laughs> eventually, people went uh, fast radio bursts, and that's what they've been called ever since. Um, so it's an analog of gamma ray bursts. Uh, they, they could have nothing to do with gamma ray bursts. We don't know that yet. They, they, or they might be related in some way. But uh, just think of them as the radio analog of gamma ray bursts. This delay that we're seeing here, this, this high dispersion measure, implies that the bursts are really, really far away. And that's why astronomers were quite convinced that they were cosmological. So cosmological means a significant distance of the observable universe, well beyond the Milky Way or the nearest galaxies. So, strange things happen when you observe cosmological sources. The universe expands significantly over the time scale in which you uh, observe the source. So here's a little graphic that demonstrates that. Let's say that the burst leaves a galaxy here, at time A, and travels to the, to the Earth, on its way to the Earth. The whole universe expands, because this, this is such a significant distance, um, that by the time the pulse has arrived at the Earth, um, the size of the universe is significantly larger than it was before. That also <coughs> means that the wavelengths of the photons is longer as well. So the photons appear to be redshifted. This is, this is a phenomenon that we call cosmological redshift. So not to get into all of the, the details, you, you can calculate the redshift, this z, as the fractional change in the observed wavelength divided by the emitted wavelength. So the amount that the um, observed length observed wavelength changes um, compared to the emitted wavelength. So if you look at that, it's lambda obs divided by lambda emit minus lambda emit divided by lambda emit. So this is 1 over 1. Sorry, it's lambda over lambda, which is 1. So you can rearrange this, and you can write this down as 1 plus the redshift is the fractional change in the uh, increase in the wavelength. <coughs> so what does that all mean? Well, you can calculate redshifts uh, in a very rough way by taking the dispersion measuring dis dispersion measure and dividing it by a thousand. So, so for those of you who know a little bit about redshifts, um, we'll know that a redshift of point uh, of one is a source that is when the universe was half of its current size. It was emitted when the universe was half of its current size. Um, and, and if you have a measurement of the redshift, you can, you can calculate the distance um, from the cosmological model. So in this particular case, we had a dispersion measure. Let's say you have a dispersion measure of 500 in these crazy units. That means that the redshift is 0.5. That turns out to be about 5 billion light years away from the Earth. So a significant distance. Um, all distances are significant in astronomy, but this is really significant. Um, for a typical fast radio burst, uh, you can estimate the amount of energy that it releases because you know how far away it was. So the energy that you receive in a few milliseconds, that's what the whole sun uh, emits in a month. So it's a lot of energy, um, but it's way less than a supernova explosion. So, and in fact, the source might, might not even know that it's releasing these radio waves. It's like, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely energetic event by our standards, but by astronomical standards, it's actually quite modest. Nevertheless, we're able to observe them, and they form a cosmological population. Here's, these stars here are some of the bursts that we see, uh, and these, these dots here are, are a simulation that we, we've been putting together that show the, the 
brightness of the bursts versus distance, and you can see that the more distant ones are fainter. Uh, and everything is uh, pointing towards the fact that they are cosmological in origin. Uh, so I want to bring you up to speed now and tell you what's happening over the last few years <coughs> in, the, in the remainder of my talk. So in 2014, uh, one of these bursts was found at the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. So the bursts, I should say, are uh, labeled in a similar way to gamma ray bursts, so FRB, fast radio burst, from 2012, November 02. So this is the burst that arrived on that date at the observatory. And you can see that there's a really faint trace there. And this was just detectable by the, by the telescope. The telescope is so big, this is a 300 meter dish that it was able to see it. So it was a great um, relief to people at the time um, because we started finding bursts with other telescopes. The Green Bank Telescope, the GBT, found, found one here that was, uh, hit the telescope in uh, May 23rd, 2011. And you can see the burst uh, not little graphic there. It's also very faint, but it shows you the power of these, these telescopes. How, how good they are at picking these things out. And people finally got to the bottom of where these peritons were coming from in 2015. So bursts started to be, be found with different telescopes. Um, we, we had this idea of um, the cosmological population, and it was realized that the peritons were completely different. They were connected to microwave emissions. So there is a visitor center near the Parkes telescope, uh, and it has, has a kitchen in it. Um, and this is what, this is an histogram, what you get if you plot the distribution of peritons versus the local time in Australia. Uh, <laughs> around lunchtime when the, when the canteen is in high demand. Now if you look closely at the, the graphic, you'll see, and my eyes are not the best, but you can see perhaps two different colors, the, the ones in uh, sort of pink here versus light blue. The light blue ones are the fast radio bursts. And if you look closely, they, they occur basically at uniform times during the day. So they have no knowledge of lunchtime, which is good. Uh, and you're, you might be wondering about the original one. It's, it's actually one of these ones. So the, the periton mystery was solved. That was, you know, was something that was masquerading as that was interference that was masquerading as an astronomical source. And so now, with all of that, sorted out, astronomers can start getting onto the, um, the important business of trying to get to the bottom of this mystery. Um, very much like gamma ray bursts, those of you who studied astronomy a bit will know that in the early days of gamma ray burst astronomy there were more theories than bursts themselves. For uh, it's very similar with fast radio bursts. <coughs> I've got a whole laundry list of things here, each bullet point, which I won't go into in, in great detail, each bullet point has a number of different sort of sub-theories that you can, like variations on a theme. So you can usually get up to 50 or 60 models here um, for the different possibilities for these bursts. And each of the, none of those can, can be really ruled out very easily at the current time. And that's because we don't know enough information yet about the, the individual fast radio bursts that we found. I should say that we found there are about 70 or 80 that are currently published, and there's a few hundred more that are about to be published. So shortly there will be more bursts than theories, um, but um, right now there's more theories than bursts. It's interesting just to look at some of these possibilities. Um, some of them are sort of close to home, perhaps, like supernova explosions. That makes sense that you might get a radio pulse from a supernova explosion. Uh, it was mentioned in the introduction, a collapsing neutron star to form a black hole is, is being postulated as a, it's called a blitz star. Um, that could, the, the collapse of the magnet, magnetic field of the neutron star could produce a radio pulse. You also have um, in spirals of objects, so two neutron stars might, inspire, might uh, collide. Um, those colliding compact objects, so neutron star, neutron star. You, you can have variations on a theme like that. So those have been seen with LIGO in gravitational waves recently, so we know that those exist, and they could possibly emit radio pulses too. As you get further down the list here, you get to more sort of esoteric suggestions, extraterrestrial signals, white holes, the mathematical reverse of a black hole. Uh, we don't know if they even exist, but they could potentially um, reduce the right energetics to 
um, explain the pulses. Cosmic strings, of course, there's always a dark matter theory. Um, light sails um, would be connected to an extraterrestrial intelligence uh, type of um, explanation. Um, so, and many, many other things as well. And so, the, fl the galactic flare stars have been ruled out, but most of the other ones still survive at some level. So, there's one really crucial thing that we now know, uh, and we've known for a couple of years, is that the, the Arecibo burst actually repeats. So, unlike most of the other ones, this one um, very sporadically will repeat uh, and send out multiple bursts. <clears throat> so, here are, here's a collection of the bursts that have been seen from Arecibo. But basically, it rules out, for this particular source, it rules out supernova explosions where you don't expect one pulse. And one day, there's no more supernova a day later. And same for an in-spiral of two stars, that would only happen once. But for these giant pulses that I talked about you know, right at the beginning of the talk, those happen um, quasi-periodically, just you know, very sporadically. And if you wait around long enough from the crab pulsar, you can, you can find an extremely bright pulse, as, as it turns out. It's so bright that if you place the crab well out of the Milky Way, you can see it perhaps as one of these fast radio bursts. So that's, very, that's a very important piece of information. The other, the other great thing with this burst was that being able to see it multiple times allowed other telescopes to, get, to go and have a look at it. And here's the VLA, a very large array in New Mexico. It produces high fidelity images of the sky, so it can, it's able to, point, to pinpoint uh, the radio sources on the sky. Uh, and it was able to see some of these pulses, and it pinpointed the, the, the pulses to be coming from this little uh, dwarf galaxy, as it's a dwarf elliptical galaxy over here. And the redshift of that galaxy could be measured very definitively, not just estimated, but actually measured. Um, so that you get uh, a distance for that um, particular source. As, a, as definitive as you can get, it's 2.3 billion light years away. <coughs> so that was that's been a really uh, important clue. Um, there's some interesting things going on about <coughs> that um, that repeating uh, fast radio burst. Um, what we think, and there's, there's, there are papers that are coming out um, basically all the time discussing the, the various ideas now. But one thing that came out recently was that um, this, uh, this repeating FRB could be coming from um, a really highly magnetized neutron star in this uh, dwarf elliptical galaxy. Um, and so what people have done is that they've, they've gone out and looked for other dwarf elliptical galaxies in the local universe, and they've, ad they've identified a candidate that looks like um, looks very similar to that. And now people are, are going to just sit on that uh, galaxy and look for, for follow-up pulses from that. The hypothesis is that it could be that um, really highly magnetized neutron star could, could come from a super, what we call a superluminous supernova explosion. Um, so there are lots of um, challenges with that. We don't know, though, if all FRBs repeat or not. Some, um, some FRBs might be cataclysmic events. They, they might have a completely different origin to the one I just sketched out. So what we need going forward are telescopes with large sky coverage um, and things, what, what we now, we're now calling the next generation of telescopes, or the square kilometer array. So in the last few minutes, I'll just talk about um, some of the things that are going on right now uh, and over the next few years. One is called ASCAP, the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder. This is an array of dishes uh, in Western Australia. It's a very re remote site, as you can imagine. It turns out to be really good at finding fast radio bursts because it's got a really large field of view. Most of the, the things that I've been describing up to now, although I haven't mentioned it specifically, they've actually got very small fields of view. This telescope can see 30 square degrees on the sky, which is a lot for a radio telescope. Um, and so what we've been doing with this uh, is um, finding fast radio burst, it's found about 20 of them so far. And we've, we've also been looking at nearby galaxy clusters, and so um, some of the students took a look at Virgo, one of the biggest clusters on the sky, um, and we found a, a fast radio burst um, that is just to the northwest of um, M87, this is, this is what, what we 
and seen x-rays of the, um, the, um, the core of the Virgo cluster. Um, the fast radio burst is over here somewhere, and here it, here it is visualized here. We don't yet know whether this burst is associated with the Virgo cluster or not, because we haven't got a good uh, redshift measurement for that, but what we're hoping to do is to keep on staring at these uh, galaxy clusters to try to find more, more of those. What's currently dominating the news, though, is what uh, is, is a telescope in Canada known as CHIME, Canadian H Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. CHIME, if you want to Google that, which one is it? It's well worth it. It's a rather unconventional radio telescope. You see these cylinders here, uh, and they, they form a, a meridian telescope that stares up at, up at the sky and watches um, sources pass through the meridian uh, as the uh, as the Earth rotates. It's got about the same collecting area as the Green Bank Telescope, so it's really sensitive, but it has a much, much larger field of view, and so it's, it's able to see these fast radio bursts uh, at a very high rate. And so here's a paper that came out at the end of last year with the first 13 discoveries. And this was just, it basically just sort of plugged the telescope in, and they started, the bursts started uh, flooding in. And we think that we, as in the, the scientific community, and you all as well, we, we don't yet know the full scale of the results yet. Um, we've, we've just been see, seeing tantalizing first detections, but we think that it, it will find up of order 50 bursts every day, um, which is a lot, so they're, they're, they're clearly being overwhelmed with data at the moment and trying to, trying to make sense of it. But I think within the next few months, you'll see in the headlines more of these discoveries coming through I've heard about, uh, just informally, about 300 of them um, that have been found. It's already found one, re one other repeating fast radio burst. And here, are, here are some different bursts from that same source that it's found. So that, that repeating source that I told you about is not now one of a kind. There's, there's clearly a population of those. And I've heard informally that it's found about six of those repeating sources. Radio astronomy is going through a real renaissance. So Chime is one of them. There's this, this telescope here, it's, uh, they put the name of it, it's called FAST, the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope. It's in uh, southwest China. Uh, it's just been built, uh, actually built, finished construction two years ago. 500 meter diameter telescope, so it's even bigger than the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico that we mentioned before. Um, I've had the privilege of going there a couple of times. It's an amazing instrument, um, real credit to the Chinese for getting it together and uh, getting, getting this on sky. Uh, so it's now doing surveys uh, of the sky, and I'm, I'm expecting it to, to contribute mm -hmm. to this field. Specifically, I think it will find really distant fast radio bursts, and that will tell us about um, what, uh, what was going on um, in that um, population in the early universe. You might be wondering what's happening in Green Bank right now. Well, literally right now, we are looking with the Green Bank Telescope uh, as of about two weeks ago, we've, we've got a system on the sky which uh, looks wherever the Green Bank Telescope is pointing, it is looking for, for FRBs in real time. So we're using GPUs to, to keep up with the data rate. And I've got some amazing students, I'm really fortunate. Um, some Two of the students have developed uh, a, a deep learning that, um, system that is allowing them to, to it's allowing the computers to look at the data in real time and actually send us any interesting candidates. So a lot of the really hard uh, work of actually looking through all of these signals is now being um, passed on to neural networks. And that's, that's something that has to be, uh, is, is, is necessary going forward as these telescopes just produce more and more data. We're also doing a cute little experiment with the um, 20 meter telescope at Green Bank where we're, look, where we're just about to, to um, look at um, gamma ray bursts. So when a gamma ray burst goes off, we'll slew to that position and see if there's anything interesting in that from the radio. Just to, just to conclude, my bold predictions are, you know, of, uh, by 2020, this has already been surpassed. You know, we've, we've not yet published, but hundreds of FRBs will be found, and they're already known. By the mid middle of the next decade, thousands of them will be known by these telescopes. And they will become, we'll promptly we'll figure out what they are, but they will become essential cosmological tools.
by the end of the next decade, is my prediction. Why do I think that? Well, for every fast radio burst, this dispersion that I was talking about gives you a measure of the number of electrons along the line of sight. Um, it also potentially encodes um, information about the magnetic field along the line of sight. So if we can measure redshifts to these sources independently, and that's going to be difficult, so not thousands of redshifts won't be available, but maybe tens or hundreds of them perhaps will. We'll have a map over the whole sky showing the electron distribution um, over large scales in the, in, the, in the universe and the magnetic field of the universe. And so that's a unique tool that astronomers have not had up to now. So there are many papers discussing this already. I just want to conclude by thanking you all. I mean, this, this work is not possible without tax dollars. So my work is supported predominantly by the National Science Foundation. I, I and my colleagues wouldn't be able to do, literally we wouldn't be able to do what we do without those tax dollars coming to West Virginia University through the National Science Foundation. We also get support from uh, private foundations. Uh, but thank you for your time and uh, for your continued support.